look at all. Is it cowardice or courage? Why this unbridled joy, only to be plunged again into utter misery? Tomorrow, I leave for Venice. I'm drawn there by a longing for peace and quiet. Wagner was 45 years old when he arrived in Venice on August 29, 1858. He had already written The Flying Dutchman, Lohengrin, Tannhäuser, and was working on The Ring of the Nibelung, but above all on Tristan and Isolde. Behind him lay long years of restlessness, of exile, of emotional and financial difficulties. Even so, he was now living through one of the most intense periods of his creative life. He was a man in flight, a man in search of a refuge. He had resolved to compose an opera of a kind that could win for him the success that had continued to elude him. His passion for Matilda Wesendonck magnified his creative powers. He was keeping a diary and was writing many letters, first and foremost to Matilda. Greatness, beauty, and decadence all at once. It's a comfort to me to see that here there's no sign of the modern. The day after my arrival, I decided on an apartment in an imposing palazzo on the Grand Canal in which, for the time being, I'm still completely alone spacious and splendid rooms through which I move at my own pleasure. As a protective shell for my work, my place of residence is of the utmost importance. And so I leave no stone unturned to arrange it just as I wish. I wrote at once for my erat. That glorious instrument will sound wonderful in the spacious and majestic salon of this palace. The vast, unique stillness of the canal has had a beneficent effect on my spirit. Venice is a far-off world of other times, so deeply in harmony with my own desire for solitude. Nothing here has the immediacy of real life. Everything here suggests a work of art. I want to stay here. Stay here I shall. Wagner rarely goes out, only about five o'clock in order to dine. He walks in the public gardens and stops briefly every evening in the Piazza San Marco. He confesses that he has no desire to visit monuments and works of art. Piazza produces a grandiose and theatrical effect with its unique atmosphere and the great ebb and flow of the crowd 
kindles a fantasy within me alone. Towards nine o'clock, I take a gondola back home. I find the lamp already lit. This solitude, which is possible for me, and so joyously possible only here, is like a promise for me, and all my hopes. I shall finish Tristan here. From here, the world will know the sublime and noble sorrow of the highest love. Stupendously beautiful at night, the Grand Canal. The stars are clear and bright, the moon in its last quarter. A gondola glides by. Okay. In the distance, gondoliers call one another with song. All of this is beautiful, sublime. These profoundly melancholy melodies sung by sonorous and powerful voices arrive from far off over the waters and fade into silence again, even farther off, drawing my spirit to sublime emotions. It is quite wonderful. Today, I still have nothing for my journal. No thoughts, only emotions, which have yet to attain clarity. I go back now to Tristan, so that in it, I may in my turn speak to you of the profound art of silence, made music. For now, the great solitude of this secluded retirement in which I live refreshes my spirit. I gather once more my vital forces that were torn in shreds so painfully. Tristan is going to cost me much in hard labor, but I feel that when it is finished, a decisive and marvelous period of my life will be at an end. I feel myself so powerfully driven on to work. The thought of you always comforts me. And with you, Venice, which miraculously calms my soul. For the first time, I breathe this pure and soft, unalterable atmosphere. The magic of the city induces in me a state of melancholy enchantment, which is quite natural in me, and so continues to delight me and to serve me well. This idyll of the lagoon takes me by surprise. An idyll for three voices, instinctively harmonized. It is unusual for me to hear the principal voice not rising beyond the limit of the contralto or reaching the register of the soprano. This idyllic sound is the music of virile youth.
In the evening, when I travel toward the Lido in a gondola, I seem to hear the long, delicate sound of a violin note. So you can imagine my state of mind when the light of the moon gently skims over the sea. For a few days now, I've not been feeling well. I've had to give up my evening gondola ride. Nothing but solitude remains for me. And this life of mine, without a future. Wagner falls ill and spends his days alone in the large and chilly rooms of the palazzo. For some weeks, he is unable to work. Painfully, he realizes that time is uselessly passing by. He is restless. I am convinced that nobody is really interested in me. I must be mad. This continual, vulgar, tormenting thirst for life. And deep down, so profound repugnance for life. I am forced to construct it for myself artificially so as not to have it constantly before me in all its unpleasantness. Why should all this suffering ever be interposed between me and the peace I yearn for, giving myself up to my work? But I want to endure, because I must. I do not belong to myself. My pain and suffering are only the means by which to attain an end that is superior to all. The real cause of all my suffering lies in my persistent inability to break decisively with life and all its yearning desires. I never succeed in obliterating the impression violence makes on me. It's terrible. The thought that our existence, ever more avid for pleasure of one kind or another, rests on the abyss of the harshest misfortune. Each thing takes me and fascinates me only if it rouses and involves my emotions and my compassion. For this is the most marked trait in my moral being and perhaps also the source from which my heart draws all its strength. They have just brought in my pianoforte. From the moment it arrived, I've been in a state of overwhelming emotion. This instrument brings out in my mind so much that is meaningful for me. You know how long I have been vainly waiting for it, for the promise of its marvelously delicate, melancholy, sweet sound. My pianoforte had seduced me and brought me back again completely to music. 
for me it is the swan that has come to lead poor Lohengrin back to his fatherland. Music is ennobled and transformed by the silence of the night. Here, nature has made itself into a world of sounds that have become visible. Deep down in me, the safe, clear feeling that this is my world, and that now I could not leave it without being in the wrong. In this world of mine, I feel happiness. I have before my eyes the true outline of my life, present past and future are distinguished one from the other as the difference between sea and sky. However, a few streaks can be picked out. They are the flat islands that here and there emerge from the indistinct. stars shine brightly there in the sky and here on the sea. Where is the past? Where the future? I see only the stars and a pure roseate gleam and in between my boat glides silently. Nothing is to be heard but the soft splash of the oars. This, then, is my present. The importunate call of death comes to Wagner's mind. by nobody. I would be free from all my torments if only I had thrown myself down. Tonight, when I drew back from the balustrade of the balcony, it was not the thought of my art that held me back. In that terrible moment, almost tangibly, the true basis of my life appeared to me, and on it, my resolution to die turned into new life. After sharing the pessimistic vision of Schopenhauer for a certain time, Wagner turned with increasing interest toward the Buddhist philosophy. He thought long on the meaning of nirvana, 
on the theme of the annihilation of desires, which is also fundamental in Tristan. Nevertheless, he did not tie himself to any one rigorous philosophic system and oscillated between pessimism and the creative and vital impulse. Since yesterday, I have been working again on Tristan. I'm still on the second act, but what music it's going to be. I could work on this music and nothing else all my life. Ah, it's becoming more and more profound and beautiful, and the most sublime marvels melt in perfect consonance with the sense of the action. Never before have I created anything like it. But I am fulfilling myself completely in this music. I live eternally in it. For three days now, I've been struggling with the passages. He whom thou hast clasped, whom thou hast smiled upon. And in thy arms. But trying them out on the piano, I've not been able to find the right notes. I felt quite crushed by this. And incapable of going on. And then suddenly, everything is clear again. You'll find some reminiscences. There's a certain flavor of the songs. But you, beloved one, will surely want to be indulgent. Wagner is finishing the second act of Tristan. He has other plans in mind and takes up Parsifal again which he had originally thought of inserting as an episode in the third act of Tristan. Once more, poetic themes present themselves to my mind. Possible has been constantly occupying me. I am more and more seduced and fascinated by the strange figure of a woman who is at once earthly and demonic and whose image unfolds itself ever more clearly before my eyes. If I succeed one day in finishing this poem, I shall have achieved something very original. He meditates on the substance of poetic conception, on the relations between the world of experience and that of the imagination. on the contrast between the common and the marvelous. My poetic ideas have always come before my actual experience. The Dutch captain, the flying Dutchman, Tannhäuser, Lohengrin, and the Nibelungs, Wotan. They were already in my mind before they were a part of my experience. The wonderful relationship that binds me now to Tristan is something that you can easily understand. Never has an idea taken on flesh so decisively in my life. Just how much the one has determined the other is a question that is so subtle and so wonderful that the normal mind cannot judge it without doing it violence and falsifying it. Now intent on the artistic completion of my work, I submit myself to the peace of contemplation on my Tristan. Who can imagine now the ecstasy that invades me utterly and carries me far from the world? So far indeed that it seems to me that it has been conquered. With the end of my second act, I have finally solved the problem, which seems so arduous to everyone, a solution that is unrivaled. 
that I never succeeded in finding before this. My most subtle and profound art. I would like now to be able to call it the art of transition. My masterpiece in the art of progressive graduation is without doubt the great scene of the second act of Tristan. In it lies the mystery of my musical formula. Wagner now complains of the cold, of the mist, of the flatness of the sea. What I miss most are excursions in the mountains and valleys. The sight of the Alps gives rise in me to an impression which is wonderful, but at the same time, melancholy. The consuming nostalgia of a young boy is then renewed in me and drives me up and on towards the peak of the mountain, where the enchanted castle in the fairy story shelters the beautiful princess. On March 24, 1859, Wagner left Venice after spending seven months there. During the journey to Milan, he wrote to Matilda. And so, in your name, my friend, I have taken leave of my Venice, of dreams. It seems to me as ever like a fairy tale vision. One day you will hear a dream which I cast into form there, in sounds. Two years go by. Wagner returns to Venice for a brief stay. The meeting with Matilda disappoints him. These are wretched days for him. He visits museums and churches in the city with the Wesendonk. He discovers Titian's assumption, and it evokes in him the figure of his soul and stimulates his creativity. Wagner decides to start De Meistersinger and already has in his mind, in a precise form, the principal elements of the overture in C major. Another 15 long years have gone by. Many things have changed in Wagner's life. He has won the great battle for the building of the theater at Bayreuth. His theater, which was inaugurated with the first performance of the Ring of the Nibelung on August 13, 1876. A year later, for the third time, Wagner came to Venice. His passion for Matilda was over, but there still remained in his mind the figures of Isolde and Venice. He has come back. He has come back again. He often goes to the Café La Vena to rest, to watch. He goes back again now over routes long familiar to him. In 1880, he works briefly on Parsifal.
The ancient lions at the arsenal summon up the figures of Fafner and Basalt in him. In the spring of 1882, at the end of his last visit to Venice, he expresses a nostalgic wish. Here. I would like to die. Wagner arrives for the last time in Venice in the autumn of 1882. He doesn't work. He is ill. He revisits the places that are dear to him.
No other city is as beautiful as this. On February 13, 1883, Wagner died in Venice.